it's a, it's a great honor. Actually, for anybody in combinatorics, Waterloo is a, an important part of the imaginary as the, the one place that has the combinatorics department. I remember thinking, oh, I would love to spend some time there. And it's actually the first time that I'm here. So it's, a, it's an honor to be here. And, uh, and it's also a great honor to speak in a series named after one of my mathematical heroes. Uh, so you know, my, my thesis was on the top polynomial. And uh, Tut keeps going in, it, it being a part of my work constantly. I was thinking that actually, I, I, I'm not saying too much about him today, but usually almost any talk that I, that I give, um, uh, he makes an appearance, and he will briefly. Um, so uh, I will be talking about the geometry of matroids. Uh, can I just uh, real quick ask people, can you please raise your hand if you're a faculty member? I just want to know who's in the room. Uh, and who's a postdoc and grad student and undergrads? Okay, cool. So uh, one reason I like to do that is to generally point out that usually in these places, it's a majority students, and uh, so the talk is mostly for you, actually. Uh, and so please do me a favor, and if you have a question, uh, then it, it is, it, it, you know, the space is for you, not for me. I, I know what I'm talking about, so uh, <laughs> <laughs> at least we should hope so. Um, and, so, and so please please don't be shy and ask me any questions. And I, I don't want to assume that you know about matrix or about geometry. I, I really tried to uh, make a talk that was as accessible as possible, okay? Uh, well, hopefully still telling you some interesting things. Um, so here's a little summary of my talk. Uh, point number one that I want to make is that matrix are everywhere. They're, they really are uh, objects that appear in a lot of places. Um, the main reason for this, I think, is that linear algebra is part of essentially every field of mathematics, and matroids are kind of the combinatorics of linear algebra, I would say. And so th that's one reason that they appear in a lot of places. Um, there are many different ways of thinking about matroids. That's something that's a little bit frustrating at first and really powerful later. Um, and so we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, and then I think the main point that I want to make is that geometry and matrix theory can really help each other very much. And so that's, a, that's kind of the, the main takeaways. And uh, most of the work that I'm going to be talking about, I mean, I, I want to survey a, a number of different things, but the results of, of uh, my work that I will be talking about are mostly joint work with uh, Carly Clivens back in 2006, and then an ongoing project with uh, Graham Denham and, and June Huss that uh, we're finished with and are in the process of writing up. Okay. Um, okay. So, so what are uh, what are matroids? Uh, the idea of a matroid is to is to kind of capture the combinatorial essence of independence, and uh, this was born out of uh, linear independence. Okay, and the, the the prototypical example of a matroid, the main example you should probably think about is if you have a a bunch of vectors. So here I have vectors in R three. Um, then I want to look at the, at the subsets of uh, those vectors that are bases of my space. So in this case, I'm in R3, so they should be triples. And, uh, and, if, and if you look at it, you realize, for example, that in a, if you want to span R3, you have to have A. So that's why every basis has to have A. Uh, D and E are dependent, so they shouldn't be together in a basis. That's why you never see D and E together here. And all the other possible combinations uh, work, and so that's why you have these five bases, okay? And so given a set of vectors, you get a, a matroid. Um, and, uh, and then you can think about what's, what's the combinatorics of this, uh, of this collection. And, uh, and there's two key properties. One is that there should be at least one basis. Um, and, the, and the main property is this one, that if, if I have a basis on my right hand side, on my right hand, and a basis in my left hand, and if I take an element that is in A and not in B, then I can replace it by an element that is in B and not in A and still get a basis. Okay. Um, so this is, uh, this is called the basis exchange lemma. Basically, it allows you to take two bases and, and exchange elements between them. And, uh, and if you've never proved this, it's, it's a fun linear algebra exercise to prove that. Okay. Now, the, the key definition, or at least one of them, uh, was due to a Nakasawa and Whitney in 1935 at about the same time, uh, we're going to say that, that a set E and a collection B uh, are called a matroid if this property is satisfied. 
Okay? So, so you if I have vectors, I get a matroid. Okay? But now I'm trying to abstract, okay, what, what is this combinatorial property that these sets of bases have? Um, and whenever a collection satisfies this property, then I'm going to call that a matroid. And uh, this matrix is going to be my running example throughout the whole talk. So, so as, I, uh, as I said, the, the one important family are these, these matrices called linear matrices that arise from start, starting with a set of vectors and looking at linear independence. Okay? Um, but these are not the only matrices in nature. I guess when I say nature, I mean mathematical nature. Um, so graphs also have a matrix. So if I have a graph, and I look at the set of edges, and then I look at the spanning trees, uh, so basically maximal sets that don't contain a cycle, uh, then that family is going to be also the set of bases of a matrix. Okay? Uh, and I chose my example carefully so that if you look at the spanning trees here, they are precisely the same bases here. Okay? So, uh, so I have a matrix that can be represented linearly or graphically. Um, now, another important family of, of matroids, and, and one that is actually surprisingly hard to think about, is algebraic matroids. It's a very important family, and it comes from algebraic independence. Okay? And so now what you want to do is you have, a, you have a field, K, and then a bigger field, L, and you take a bunch of elements in the big field and look at when they are algebraically independent over the small field. Okay? So just to, to, to make this concrete, I'm just, I'm just thinking of these as, as a kind of polynomial equations, polynomial expressions, and then I want to see which ones are linearly independent. Okay, so, so here, for example, you see that, that A is independent from everybody else, um, whereas D and E depend on each other. And that's, that's analogous to A being independent from everybody here and D and E uh, being dependent to each other, and the same with A being a bridge here and D and E being dependent to each other. Okay, so, and so, uh, if you do it carefully, you find that the matroid, the algebraic matroid of this collection, is also that same matroid. Okay? Um, and for example, if you learn a commutative algebra from Eisenbach's book at some point, I think he, <laughs> he confessed to me once that he didn't want to put matroids in his book, but he had to, because there's some things that he wanted to prove about uh, algebraic ex extensions and, and uh, about field extensions, and, and really the, the natural proof is with matroids, and he didn't know a better one. So, so this family is quite important. Um, and another important family is transversal matrix, where you have a, maybe people and jobs, okay? And now you're trying to assign a, a job to each person, okay? Um, and then the question is, what is the set of jobs that can be assigned? And for example, here you can see I chose this very carefully. So, so and, and, and these are, are somehow the jobs that people are willing to take. Uh, so the person number one is, can only take job A, okay? And that's why you would give them job A just like you had to choose A, you had to choose A, you had to choose A here. Uh, here, uh, you cannot assign jobs D and E simultaneously because they would have to go to the same person, okay? Um, and, so, and so, again, if you do it carefully, you find that if you want to give different jobs to people one, two, and three, then the sets of jobs that you can assign are precisely these triples. And that's called the transversal matrix, okay? Uh, and what you cannot read is that if you have a theorem for matroids, that immediately gives you a theorem about vectors, one about graphs, one about field extensions, one about matchings. And there's many other families, but these are four important ones just to show you that these uh, objects uh, really appear very naturally in a lot of places, okay? So that's one reason to care a lot about, uh, about matroids. Now, um, there are many different points of view to matroids, and if you want to work with matroids, at first you find this frustrating and, and, and you really have to get used to it. That given, a, given a matroid, there's many different ways of describing it. Uh, and uh, in terms of the linear algebra, it's actually quite clear what you're doing. So we already talked about the basis. This is how I'm going to describe uh, this matroid. But I could also say, let me not just list the basis, let me list all the independent sets, okay? So, of course, you're independent if you're a subset of a basis. If you're in this case, you're linearly independent. And so here I've listed all the linearly independent sets that I can make out of here. And as we know, the, the bases are the maximal independent sets, but then there's a bunch of others 
smaller ones. Okay? So I'm going to call that collection I. Now I can take a different point of view, which is the circuits. And, uh, and the circuits are going to be the minimal linear independences. So for example, here I have an equation E equals 2D. E and D are linearly independent. And so I record that as a minimal linear dependence. If I put B, C, D here, then that means that over there, there must be a linear equation uh, satisfied by B, C, and D. I guess in this case, it's B plus C equals 2D. Okay? And so you just look at what are the, what are the, the, the linear relations that, that occur here. Um, and then those are going to be your circuits. And there's a way of defining this combinatorially. But you really want to think of these as minimal dependencies. And in the graph, this is clearest because in a, in a graph, the circuits are actually the, the cycles of the graph. So here's D and E, here's B, C, and D, and here's B, C, and E. Okay? So that's a third way of thinking about matroids. Now, um, we'll come back to this in a moment, but it turns out that something that is useful to do is to take the circuits and remove the biggest element according to alphabetical order. And uh, so I'm going to also consider this set called the broken circuits, where you just take each circuit and you chop off the biggest element. So out of D and E, I remove E. Out of B, C, and D, I remove D. Out of B, C, and E, I remove B, C. This are called the broken circuits. Do you have a question? Sorry, can you say that again? Yeah, so um, when you said these are different points of view of looking at matroids, do you mean that, um, that independence is the only part that matters and that the fact that it's the biggest is not the integral definition? So, so if I may rephrase to your question, you're asking uh, why do I say these are different points of view? Uh, one practical reason is that if you, if you open a paper about matroids, some of them say a matroid is a collection B such that blah, 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 blah. But you open a different paper, and it says a matroid is a collection C, such that blah, 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 blah. And, and each collection has its own different axioms. And when, you, and when you start working in this, it becomes indispensable for you to go back and forth from these different axiom systems. Uh, so they're really different, different uh, ways of thinking about the same object. So every, every matroid can, can talk about it in all these different ways, and it is useful to go back and forth. And I'm not just trying to subject you to as many definitions as possible. Each one of these definitions is going to come up in my talk, so I, I need to show them to you. And there's a fourth, and then I'll stop, I promise. <laughs> um, flats. Um, so the flats are the spanned sets. Okay. So what I mean by that is that you look at your collection, and, and then you see what are, the, what are the subspaces that are spanned. So for example, this line contains only A, so that's a flat. B is a flat. But, but this line contains D and E, and so that's a flat. Okay? Now, for example, if I see A, D, E here, then there should be a plane in this picture that contains vectors A, D, and E. When you look for it, there it is, A, D, and E. And for example, this plane in the bottom is B, C, D, E, so that's this one. So, so those are the spanned sets. Okay? Um, so you basically look at the, what are the lines, what are the planes, what is the three-dimensional space, and, and then do that. So these are four different points of view, bases, independent sets, circuits, and flats. And I want to leave these up and show you how actually these things, these things arise very naturally in different contexts, and different people think, them, think about them very differently. So for example, one thing that we usually do with, a base, with the bases is that we like to make a polytope out of them. Okay? So let me draw that polytope. Um, and the way that I do this is that I say, okay, if A, B, C is a basis, then I'm going to make a vector that has ones in coordinates A, B, and C, and zeros in coordinates D and E. Okay, so, so this, course, uh, this I might call the vector E. Well, I, 
think I'm going to run into trouble with notation here. So this, this corresponds to the basis A, B, C. OK? And so basically, what I do is that I take each basis, and, I, and this really is the point 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, and R5. So each basis gives me a point. Um, and when I do this, I'll ask you to trust me. I prepare this ahead of time. And the polytope looks like this. So I just take these five points. They correspond to the five bases. And then I look at the polytope that they generate. Okay? You might be surprised that this is a three-dimensional polytope when this is in R5. But there's, there's a reason for this. One is that the first coordinate is always 1. So even though I'm in R5, I'm in the plane xA equals 1. So that's now four-dimensional. But the other thing is that the sum of the coordinates is always 3, because every basis has size 3. So I'm, I'm on, on a second plane, xA plus xB plus xC plus xB plus xE equals 1. So I'm on an additional slice. So from dimension 5, I go down to dimension 3, and that's why this is a three-dimensional polytope. OK? Um, so that is the set of bases. It's natural to turn into a polytope. Okay? Now, if I look at the independent sets, It turns out that there's something different that is natural to do there. Which is to treat independent sets as a simplicial complex. So what I mean by this is that I give each one of them a point. Then I put an edge for every independent pair. So the only pair that was not independent was DE. And that's why it well, should be an E, I guess. Yeah. And that's why you don't see an edge from D to E. Yeah. And then every time I see an independent set of size 3, then I put a triangle here. Okay. And so really, you should think of this as, if, I hope you can, you can see it. It's, it's kind of a, a, a sphere made of triangles. Okay, uh, and so this is this is how this is a very natural way of modeling um, the independent sets. Okay, so when I think of a base of the bases, I actually think of the polytope. When I think of independent sets, I usually think of the simplicial complex. Um, what's a simplicial complex, by the way? A simplicial complex is a collection like this, such that if you have a set, then every subset of it is also in your family. So uh, this is a simplicial complex because if you have something independent, then something contained in it is also independent. Okay? So that's what I would do with this family. With the circuits, I do something different. Okay? So with the circuits, uh, one thing that I like to do with, with the circuits, and it's not just me, um, is make a polynomial ideal out of them. So I'm going to imagine I'm in, a, I'm in the ring uh, with coordinates x a, x b, x c, x d, x e, the polynomial ring. And then I'm just going to make the ideal generated by the circuits. OK, so there's that. There's that. And there's that. Okay. This might seem like a strange thing to do, um, but there are algebraic reasons to do this. And, and uh, I'll say a little bit more about that. Okay. So, so circuits like to be put in a polynomial ring. Okay. Uh, what do flats like to do? Something different. So flats like to live in a poset. Where I just order them by containment. Okay? So there's A, B, C, D, A, B, A, C, A, D, E, B, C, D, E. Then there's A, B, C, and D, E. You can see that I'm, that I'm 
putting them in different floors according to the dimension of the flat, okay? And then I just put an edge whenever there's a containment. So A is containing this one and this one and this one, B is containing this one and this one, C is containing this one and this one, D is containing this one and this one, and just like that, okay? This is where flats like to live. They like to be opposed. And it turns out that this is actually a lattice. So what does a lattice mean? It means that if you have two elements of the poset, then there's a unique greatest lower bound and a unique least upper bound. <laughs> we find it really hard just to remember how to say these things, okay? This is a lattice. Um, and I hope I will show you that, that, that all of these points of view are relevant at the same time. So that I think you can see how this is a little bit frustrating, that you have to hold four different thoughts in your mind at the same time. But, it, but I feel like one of the most powerful things we do in matrix theory is change languages. I think as mathematicians, we, that's one of the more powerful things we can do is, is take some language and then translate it into a different language and see what just happened. And this is something that in matrix theory we do a lot of. Okay? So many points of view. Uh, there's bases, independent sets. Uh, there's broken circuits. Uh, there's circuits, or they might be broken. By the way, I can, I can also do the same thing with the broken circuit ideal, which is to just omit the biggest, um, the biggest element of each uh, circuit. And of course, these two merge into one, okay? So both circuits and broken circuits like to be an ideal, flats like to be a lattice, okay? And I really like this quote by Giancarlo Rota. He, he, he was a man of strong opinions and very flowery language. So he says, it is as if one were to condense all trends of present day mathematics onto a single finite structure, a feat that, would, that anyone would a priori deem impossible were it not for the fact that matroids do exist. <laughs> he, he, he liked matroids. Uh, <laughs> but but uh, the, the more time passes, the more that I agree with, with, his, with his very strongly worded opinions. And, and I do find that it actually is very useful to, to use these different trends in, in what is now pretty modern mathematics. Um, and, and think from these points of view, okay? So this is kind of a general uh, introduction to a matroids, and maybe it's a good point to see if any, if any students have any questions of, about anything that I've, that I've said so far. So the, quest, the question was, what are the circuits of an algebraic matroid? Um, so circuits always talk about relations. And so in an algebraic matroid, a circuit corresponds to a polynomial relation between your, between your things. So if, if we go back to the example of an algebraic matroid, then, for example, I have an equation, d squared equals e. And that polynomial equation um, tells me that D and E are, are dependent. So D, E is going to be a circuit. Circuits uh, are polynomial equations now. Thanks for the question. Um, okay, so let me talk about the characteristic polynomial. Uh, it's, a, it's a really beautiful polynomial. Maybe it doesn't look beautiful to you if you just see this and you haven't seen it before. Um, I'll show you this definition just to, just to write it down explicitly. So you look at uh, your set, you look at all the subsets of your set, and then you do minus one to the size of the subset and Q to the core rank. And, and uh, the rank is basically, you know, these, these things are, uh, are leveled by floors according to, I mean, this, this is like the rank from, from, uh, from linear algebra, basically. You can think of it in that way, okay? So that's the characteristic polynomial, and, and you can compute it. Um, and let me just show you a couple of ways of thinking about this. So for example, you can compute it using the flats. And uh, if you haven't seen this, I think it's nice to see it. So the way that you do this is that you define the, the Mobius function of a poset. Um, if you're not familiar with this, but you are familiar with the Mobius function from number theory, this one generalizes that one. So the Mobius function, what you do is that you, you put a, a one in the bottom, and then at each point, you put the negative of the sum of the things below it. You add everything below it, you change the sign. So 
So here you get minus ones because there's, there's only one under each one, okay? Now under this one, and, and when I say under, I mean in the positive. So less than this one, I, I have two negative ones and a one. The, the sum should be zero, that's how you can think about it. So I need to put something here so that this sum is equal to zero, which means that this should be a one. For these two add up to zero, this should be a one. For this two add up to zero, this should be a one. And then for this two add up to zero is different because this one is about three minus ones and a one. So that means that the, the Mobius function here is two. Okay. And then this should be the number that makes all of these add up to zero. So I guess I need to put a minus two here. Okay. And then you just add up one minus four, five, and two. And then these are going to be the coefficients of, uh, of that plot up, okay? So it's q cubed minus 4q squared plus 5q minus 2, okay? So you see in the first definition, I was supposed to sum over every single subset. There's 32 of them. That's a huge sum. And this is a much more economical way of doing that calculation, okay? This is one reason we like the lattice of flats, because it, it allows you to compute this, po this polynomial very nicely. Okay? I don't think that answers why you want to compute this polynomial. I still need to convince you of, of why this is an interesting polynomial. Um, one thing that I want to say is that for graphical matrix, so for graphs, um, if you remember the graph that this came from, came from this graph, okay? And a, I want to compute the chromatic polynomial of this graph. What's the chromatic polynomial? I want to color each vertex in such a way that neighbors always have different colors. I have Q colors, so I can use any color here. Now, I need to color this one of a color different from this one. So I have Q minus one options for what color to put here. I want to color this vertex so that I don't use any of these two colors, which are different. So this should be Q minus two. And then here, I can use any color except for the one that I used here, Q minus one. So the number of colorings is Q, Q minus one squared, Q minus two. And I claim that if you forget about the Q, then this is equal to that. Okay, so this is Q times Q cubed minus 4Q squared plus 5Q minus 2, okay? So if you like the chromatic polynomial, then you should like this one because it's more general. This is, a, this is a direct generalization of the chromatic polynomial, okay? So that's one reason to care about this. Now let's go to the simplicial complex, okay? So if I come to independent sets, and now, I can't see over there. Can somebody remind me what the broken circuits were? And so let, let's forget about the x's. So then it's D and BC. Okay. So now let me look at the independent set uh, complex. So this is a simplicial complex. And let me look at the faces that don't contain these. Okay, so, so D is forbidden. And BC is forbidden. You can't contain those. Let's see what's left. Okay, let me bring a different color. So what is left is these four points, these edges, and these two triangles. You see that? So this is the part of the independence complex that doesn't contain broken circuits. This is called the broken circuit complex according to the order that I chose, 
Okay. Now let's look. How many uh, how many triangles do I have here? I have two blue triangles. How many edges do I have? One, two, three, four, five. How many vertices do I have? One, two, three, four. And then the next thing in the sequence is the empty set, which is one. Okay? And I get one, four, five, two, which which are the same numbers that I got over there. Okay, so this this characteristic polynomial actually likes playing with this with the simplicial complex. It's just counting the it's called the F vector of the broken circuit complex, okay? So it knows about it, and it, and it likes it. Um, so that's what I wrote over here. And then the last thing that I write, which I won't compute because it would take me too long, is that, you know, in, in all of mathematics, we like measuring things, and the way that you measure an ideal is you take this Hilbert series. This, this is a homogeneous ideal, so you can take the quotient uh, by the broken circuit uh, ideal. And then the Hilbert series that you get is basically the, the characteristic polynomial again. Okay? And, so, and so the characteristic polynomial also likes to play with this model. And so the characteristic polynomial is, is, is a very good unifying framework for, for thinking about how to measure all of these things. Okay? It's going to be one of, one of the main characters of my talk. Um, I feel like a, one should never talk about the characteristic polynomial and not talk about the tut polynomial. Um, and the tut polynomial is what you get, it's essentially what you get if you change this minus one to a variable t. Then you will get something that is equivalent to the tut polynomial, okay? And uh, whenever you are trying to count any, anything in matroid, in graphs, in, in, uh, in a lot of these models, the first thing that I ask myself is, is it given by the tut polynomial? And I've made a career out of writing papers that say, look, this is also counted by the tut polynomial. <laughs> uh, it's, it's a really powerful polynomial, and there's good reasons for that, okay? Uh, which, of course, tut knew a lot of them. Um, okay, so that, that is a, maybe a, a too quick introduction to matroids. So hopefully I've convinced you that there's a lot of matroids out there. There might be one in, 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 in the kinds of things that you like thinking about. A, there are several different ways of thinking about matroids. Um, and the enumeration in all these models is, is closely related. So I think this is a, a good summary for right now. So maybe I'll also see if anybody has any other questions before I, I move on. I'm about to go to the geometry, just so you know. So yeah, question? I can repeat your question if you, if you want. That's, that's a really good question. So um, I went from the circuits to the broken circuits by removing the largest element of each circuit. But what does that mean? Uh, that doesn't mean anything unless I agree on what is the order of my ground set. The most natural thing is to, for me was to choose alphabetical order, but I could choose a different order. Um, I would get a different complex. And, and it's not going to be isomorphic, actually. You can get a totally different complex. And so part of the magic here is that even though the complex can be very different, um, at least the F factor is the same, the Hilbert series is the same, all of these things are the same. But, but you're right that this is not at all a, a trivial thing. Yeah, it's a good point. Okay, um, so let's see. Are matrices geometric? Let, uh, matrices came out of linear algebra and, uh, and I think matroid theory spent a lot of time trying to capture all of linear algebra in matroids. And then there was this tension when people realized, oh, uh, actually not every matroid is linear. You can't always give a set of vectors for a matroid. Okay? Um, can I ask you to give me a number? I'm, for, I'm sorry that I forgot your name, but five. Five, okay. So I asked her to give me a number. She gave me an integer, right? Uh, I know you're very well aware that most numbers are not integers. Uh, but I think if I had asked any of you, you would have given me an integer, even a positive integer. Almost every number that we think of is an integer, 
or at least rational. It's very hard to think of a irrational number. Um, and it turns out, and this is, this is a theorem due to Peter Nelson, who's here somewhere, uh, that the same thing is true for matroids, that if I ask you to think of a matroid, it's going to be linear, because we just don't have the, such a great imagination. Uh, and you have to work kind of hard to find things that are not linear. And yet, almost no matroids are linear, just like almost no numbers are integer. Okay? So it's kind of a similar thing. So matroids are just a huge family that's much bigger than linear algebra. And I think that's good to remember. And I think that that frustrated matrix theorists for a good period of time, and there was this quest for the missing axiom. You know, we had the, this, I said a matroid was something that satisfies this one axiom, but they, all, they thought, what, what if I add a new axiom that really captures and, and throws out the things that are not linear? And that was a project that, that was around for many years, and, and uh, it pretty recently, it was pretty spectacularly shut down. Uh, it, this, this cannot be done. There is no missing axiom that is really going to capture representability. Representability is just not fully combinatorial. Um, and I want to say this is not a flaw. This is a feature. This is like what Microsoft would say, right? <laughs> 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 but in this case, I mean it. And well, maybe they mean it too, but in this case, it's true. Uh, this is not a flaw. A, Matroids are a much better family because they're not all representable. And that's what I want to convince you of, that matroids are actually very natural geometrically by themselves. And we don't want to just restrict to the linear ones. Actually, the whole family is really nice. Okay? Um, and so this is my main point that I want to make today, is that matroids are natural geometric objects. And uh, let me turn back to Rhoda again. So, uh, so this, is some, this is from a class that I took from him, and these are the notes. His, he wrote, matroids turn people off. People are scared of them. When I wrote my book on matroids, I changed the name. I called it combinatorial geometries. But it didn't take. People said, oh, that's really matroids, isn't it? <laughs> uh, he, uh, and actually Jim was just telling me that this was a bigger fight than I realized. But, uh, so uh, throughout, throughout the history of matroid theory, some people wanted to call them matroids. Some people were like, wanted to call them geometries. And apparently, it got pretty heated, uh, this debate. Uh, and Rhoda always wanted to call them geometries, but that didn't really stick so much, and, and they're called uh, matroids. But the point that I'm trying to make is that, actually, I, I think that Rhoda had a, a, a very good point that, that the roots of matroids are in geometry. And there's also new results that, that Rhoda uh, didn't know about that I think show that matroids are, are more geometric than he might have realized. So that's, that's some of the things that I want to talk about. Um, so the talk was called The Geometry of Matroids, and I thought about just calling it The Geometry of Geometries. Um, but uh, so let's talk about some geometry, OK? So uh, what I want to uh, discuss next is how we have these different models for matroids. Uh, but uh, I, I want to discuss, we'll see, we'll see if I get through all of them, but, but I have three uh, geometric models for a matroid. Um, one of them you already saw. It's the polytope. And there's two more. And I, and I, I want to, uh, what I would like to do is show you how you can take a matroid, and there's at least three different geometric constructions for it. And it's not only fun to do that, but, but these constructions really allow us to prove things that were not possible without the geometry. That's, that's, a, that's, uh, that's what I would like to do. OK? So this definition, uh, I, al uh, I already illustrated. If I take a matroid and I look at the bases and I turn them into 0, 1 vectors, I get this matroid polytope. Okay. Um, this, the, the history of this slide is pretty amazing, because uh, Jack Edmonds uh, it comes from the, th from the uh, School of Combinatorial Optimization. Gelfand, Goreski, my first and Serganova come from algebraic geometry. And they arrived at this concept independently. And I want to say a couple of words about this. Um, so the matrix polytope arises in at least two natural ways. So in, in optimization, Edmonds found it as follows. Um, there's, a, there's a very classical problem, which is the minimum spanning tree problem. We talked about how for a graph, the bases are the spanning trees. And so the question is, if you have a graph and you have costs on each edges, on each edge, how can you span the whole tree as cheaply as possible? Okay? 
And if you, if you generalize this to matroids, then given a, a cost for each matroid element, what is the basis that is the cheapest? This is a very typical optimization question. And this is where it's good to talk to people in different departments because I, I wouldn't have thought of this, but they usually say, well, let's make a polyset out of this. That's a, that's a very standard technique in optimization. And so Edmonds came up with this polytope and basically realized that a cost function is an assignment of C1, C2, C3, C4, C5. That's just a vector in five-dimensional space, okay? So it's just pointing in some direction. Um, and this is the dot product of this direction vector with the vertex. And so you're just looking for the vertex that is farthest along in this direction. It's a very geometric thing, and linear programming tells you how to do this, okay? Um, and that's why this is a really natural uh, construction from the point of view of optimization, okay? Now, almost 20 years later, this arose very different in, in algebraic geometry. Um, and uh, let me kind of draw a kind of a wavy picture here. So if, if you have a, let's look at our, at our vectors over there. So let's say the coordinates are A has coordinates 1, 0, 0. B has coordinates 0, 1, 0. C has coordinates 0, 0, 1. So this is A, B, C, D has coordinates 0, 1, 1. So I guess 0, a half, a half. And E has coordinates 0, 1, 1. Okay? So these five vectors are, these five vectors. Um, but what I want to do is take the span, the, the row span of this. Let's call it V. So V is a space, a, sub, a subspace of R5, okay? And, and there's a key lemma here, which is that if I change these five vectors, but I keep the span fixed, the matroid doesn't change, okay? And that means that to know the matroid of these five things, you just need to know what the subspace is. So, so the matroid, so linear matrices are actually just associated to a subspace of a vector space with a system of coordinates. That's all you need, okay? And if you're an algebraic geometer, which I'm not, but I like talking to them, um, then a, a subspace in a vector space is a point in something called the Grassmannian. So in this case, it's the Grassmannian of three planes in five space. So this is the, the moduli space of three subspaces in, in five space, okay? Each point here corresponds to one of them. Um, and a, maybe I, I won't say too much about this, except that there's, there's, a, there's a torus acting here. There's an algebraic torus acting here. A, the torus acts on this thing. And then what it does is that it takes, the, it takes a point and it just moves it around. Okay, so you take the point and then the torus just makes it move around. Um, it goes and does over like this, maybe it goes around and then, and, and so you get this, this torus orbit, you take the closure and this is a toric variety, okay? Um, and the, the thing about toric varieties is that they're a very combinatorial family of algebraic varieties and Every toric variety, by something called the moment map, becomes a polytope. It's a very natural construction in algebraic geometry. So when you take this toric variety and, I, uh, and you apply this moment map, you get some polytope, and you can guess which polytope you get. It's exactly the matrix polytope of this thing. Okay. So maybe the details, I don't know. If you know this stuff, maybe you understood what I said. If, you don't, if you're not very familiar with this, the point that I want to make is that this is a natural construction that very naturally spits out the matrix polytope. It's, it's, it's another place where it's a very natural concept, okay? So that's how they discovered it. And uh, they proved this theorem that uh, if my history is correct, I think Edmonds proved half of this theorem and uh, Gelfand, Goreski, and Mark Christensen are gonna approve the other half. 
I should say also that, that this is a team of two and another team of two that discovered this simultaneously. So there's actually three teams that discovered this at the same time. But uh, the, the theorem that I find really beautiful is that um, if I have a bunch of sets and I make the polytope out of them, then if I started with a matroid polytope, sorry, if I started with a matroid, then when I look at this polytope, every edge is of the form EI minus EJ. So if I subtract this minus this, I get one, one, sorry, I get zero, zero, one minus one, zero. It's of the form EI minus EJ. So if you start with a matroid, then the S directions are EI minus EJ. If I don't start with a matroid, those are not the S directions. So this fully characterizes matroids, okay? And so I can actually make a definition. I, if, if I like this point of view, which I do, then I would say a, a matroid is just a polytope inside the cube that has these S directions, okay? If you are used to playing with zone tools, I know, I know Benoit has a, a big zone tool exhibition in his office, and, and maybe some of you have played with these things. There are these tools where you have to make polytopes, but the, but the directions are very constrained. And so this is kind of like a zone tool constraint that you have these very concrete edge directions and from them you're trying to make a polytope. And if it closes up and you get a polytope, then that's a matroid, okay? I think this is a really beautiful theorem. Um, and uh, the point that I want to make about this is that this theorem doesn't care if the matroid is linear or not, okay? This characterization, under this characterization, linear matroids are just as natural as nonlinear matroids. And if you want a theorem like this to be true, then, then this is a, you know, uh, dealing with nonlinear matrix, I think, is not a, an expensive price to pay for something so, so beautiful, okay? Um, so so this, is, this is a, a classification of matrix. Um, let's talk about some applications. Uh, so Laforgue, I think this is kind of what he was doing as, he won the Fields Medal in 02, and this came like the year after. I'm actually not sure this was related to his Fields Metal work, but he proved this theorem that if you have a matroid polytope that cannot be cut into smaller matroid polytopes, then that matroid has finitely many linear representations. If you're used to thinking about representations of matroids, this is a crazy theorem. This is, this is really a, a very different kind of theorem. Uh, and many of us do like to think about representation, represent, representing matroids. And this kind of result is, is very unusual to get. And it says that if you want to understand representations of matroids, it's very important to know how a matroid can be split into smaller matroids. Okay? When, I, when I think of a matroid, I think of these polytopes. So let me give you an example. If I take a, a, a square pyramid and I put another square pyramid in front of it, then the result is a, is a matroid polytope that gets split into two matroid polytopes. So that's a matrix subdivision, okay? And this shows that, that you want to think about matrix subdivisions uh, pretty naturally. And that led to a very beautiful theory, and, and I think the, the, the most important result is due to Harm Dersen and my former student, uh, Alex Fink. Uh, they have a really, a really uh, beautiful theory of matrix subdivisions. Um, another thing that I'll say is that through this toric dictionary, if you want to know the degree of this green toric variety, it's the volume of this matroid polytope. And so then you say, oh, you can, can I compute the volume of a matroid polytope? And because a matroid polytope is a part of this family, uh, with my students, Carolina Venetti and Jeff Docker, we were able to compute its volume. And so that means that we can, we can compute the degrees of these varieties uh, completely combinatorically. Okay. Um, and so that's more like matroids given back to geometry because that's more of a geometric theorem. Um, if you like half algebras, uh, there is, so what's a half algebra? It's, it's an algebra where you multiply things and you co-multiply things. So you're gonna take all matrix, and the way you multiply two matrix is you take something called their direct sum, okay? So you take the, the, the vector spaces spanned by all matrix, and then you're gonna define a product which is direct sum of matrix, and you're going to define a co-product which uh, I'll, I'll say it briefly, the coproduct of a matroid is the sum of all the ways of taking the restriction tensor the contraction. Okay. Uh, again, if you're familiar with half algebras, maybe you, you follow what I'm saying. If not, I'm saying there's some algebraic object that you're constructing from the most natural matroid operations. 
And Hopf algebras, so this was constructed by Johnny and Rota in 78. And every Hopf algebra has an antipode, which plays the role of the inverse. Like in a, in a group, you have inverses. In a Hopf algebra, you have antipodes. Um, and it wasn't really known what was the best formula for the antipode of a matroid. And, uh, and we accidentally stumbled into this theorem with Marcelo Aguiar that the antipode of a matroid is basically the polytope minus its facets plus its edges. Plus, so it's basically the alternating sum of the faces of the matroid polytope. So in other words, the, the antipode of the matroid is essentially given by the matroid polytope. And we find this very surprising because this is a, constru this is a construction that only relies on the most classical uh, matroid operations. And it shows that this object is not only geometric, but it's also algebraic. It, it really arises completely naturally in this setting. And I think the reason that people hadn't found this formula is that, is that they weren't thinking about the polytope. Once you think about the polytope, this is not so hard to prove. Okay. Um, so this is also a a very algebraic object. One that I find really intriguing is that uh, this set of vectors is very important all over mathematics. This is called the root system of the Lie algebra SLN. But this is only one of the semi-simple Lie algebras, and then there's others. And you could say, OK, what if I take now some other root system and see what polytopes can I make with those roots? Okay. And so that leads to a theory of Coxeter matroids that was pioneered by Gelfand and Sarganova. Uh, which I think, need, I think that area needs more love. I think it's a, I think it's a really a potentially very rich area that hasn't received a lot of attention. So, so these are some of the applications of, of this first model. Okay. Um, so that's model one, the matrix polytope. Okay. Model two, uh, Bergman fan. So. A, this is the Bergman fan of this example that I keep doing. And it's basically the same thing as the lattice of flats. Okay? That's a theorem. That's not, that's not so clear from the outset. But here what I'm doing is that every one of these flats gets a ray. So this is the origin. And then you get all these rays. And there's one ray for each flat. And then I fill in a triangle. I guess one thing is that I, I drop the top and the bottom flat. So there's, there's eight elements here. There's eight rays here. And then I fill in a triangle, like between B and AB, whenever there's a containment here. OK, so the, the rays correspond to the flats. And the faces correspond to the chains of flats. OK? And you make this, this geometric model. And we call this the Bergman fan. Why is this a good thing to do? These objects also appear very naturally in nature, something called tropical geometry. Um, and I'll tell you very briefly what tropical geometry is. Tropical geometry studies algebraic varieties by doing a process called tropicalization. It takes something in algebraic geometry, and by looking at the variety and how it behaves at infinity, you get this piecewise linear object. So you go from algebraic varieties to uh, piecewise linear objects. Okay. Uh, the nice thing about this is that this polyhedral complex still knows some things about the variety, um, but it's polyhedral, which means that I like to, I like to think about it more. I'm a little bit scared of algebraic varieties, uh, but this is a nice dictionary that says, "Oh, I can think about algebraic varieties by tropicalizing them and try to see if I can I can understand some things here." Okay. Um, and this is a field that has a lot of successes. There's a lot of enumerative geometry problems that can be solved tropically. Um, some very deep theorems have been proved in this regard. But a very natural question is just, what, what are the tropicalizations of some, of some basic things? And a question that Sturmf was asked, I think he was crucial in understanding the importance of this question, is, OK, so you take varieties and you tropicalize them. Why don't we start with the simplest possible variety, which is just a linear space, like this one? What is the tropicalization of this linear space? It should be some piecewise linear object. And then what we proved is that the tropicalization is exactly that, that fan that I just showed you. Okay, so, so sometimes we call these tropical linear spaces because, uh, because uh, yeah, that's what they are. The tropicalization of a linear space is the Bergman fan. So that's why these things appear naturally. Um, now, let me say briefly that just like in algebraic geometry, 
varieties have a notion of degree. So for example, how do I know that a parabola has degree two? I intersect it with a line, and I find that there's two points of intersection. Okay, that's how you figure out degree in algebraic geometry. In tropical geometry, there's an analogous thing. If I take a tropical variety, like a tropical parabola, so to say, I need to intersect it with a tropical line and see if it hits in two points. That's the tropical degree. And the remarkable theorem is that the algebraic degree gets preserved under tropicalization. It becomes the tropical degree, okay? And here's another theorem that I like very much, which is that a tropical variety has tropical degree one if and only if it comes from a matrix. So there's this realm of tropical varieties. And I look at what are the simplest ones. They're, they should be the ones of degree one. Those are like the tropical and analog of a linear space. And so what this theorem of Alex Fink shows is that a tropical linear space is precisely a matroid. So we can think of matroids as just being the tropical analogs of linear spaces. Okay? And again, from this point of view, it doesn't matter if the matrix, the matrix is representable or not. That's completely irrelevant. And so we should embrace non-representable matrix if we want theorems like this to be true. Okay. Um, so at this point, I would like to tell you that I, I think the tropical geometry needs uh, matrix people like many of you. Because for example, what's a, what's a manifold? Classically, a manifold is something that locally, it looks flat. Right? That's, that's, uh, Locally, it looks like a linear space. So what's a tropical manifold is something that locally looks like a matroid. And so if you want to develop a theory of tropical manifold, it's, it's, this is a tropical manifold, and it's very hard to see. But the point is that this is a picture where locally you see matroids, and they're just kind of matroids glued together. Okay. And that's why matroid theory is going to play a very important role in, in, this, in this theory of manifolds. Um, now, a, a pretty spectacular uh, development is that uh, this, uh, if you look at the coefficients of the characteristic polynomial, they go up and they go down. This is a very old conjecture from the 60s. Uh, and, uh, and this was only proved uh, the paper just was published earlier this year. And um, why do we care about things that go like this? First, because once something goes like this, you want to know why. It's, it's a natural question. It's, like, it's, it's pretty, so you want to know why. But I think uh, maybe a, 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 be a better answer is that these things tend to be really hard to prove. And, and you don't get theorems like this unless you work really hard and discover some new structure. And, and this is a really beautiful paper by Karima Di Prasito, Jun Ho, and Eric Katz, where they basically develop the cohomology of that uh, Bergman fan. And the thing is that in classical, classical cohomology has tools to prove things like this in, in algebraic geometry. And so they thought, can we somehow borrow those tools? And you can't borrow them. You have to develop them from scratch. And so what they prove is that the, the cohomology so a, a, a tropical, a combinatorial version of cohomology for these things behaves as if it was the cohomology of a smooth algebraic variety. Um, and, uh, and as a consequence, you get, you get this theorem. Okay? Um, so, and so that, I think, is a very, a very important application where th these kinds of things just weren't possible without, uh, without uh, that geometric viewpoint. Um, let, me, let me conclude by briefly showing you this, this last model, and I just want to show it to you to see if anybody recognizes it, because we've come to believe that this seems to be an important matroid object, something that we that actually, <laughs> this morning I decided to call this a biflag. I don't know if this name will stick. But what's a biflag? It's a flag of flats of the matroid and a flag of flats of the dual matroid that satisfy this property. I, I know that doesn't say much, um, but um, you, can make a, you can make a fan out of this by saying, okay, the rays of this fan 
come from taking a flat of the matroid and a flat of the dual matroid whose union is the whole set. If that has a name in matroid theory, I would love to know. Um, and then you insert cones according to, some according to this combinatorial condition. I didn't show a picture because this, this fan is very complicated and I can't draw any interesting example. Um, but this is a natural fan. It, it seems to be kind of a Lagrangian analog of the Bergman fan. Uh, and the main application that we have for it is that uh, we were also able to prove that the cohomology of this fan behaves as nicely as, as a smooth algebraic variety, which means that we also get some kind of unimodality and lock concavity result, uh, which, was a, which is actually a significant strengthening of the adiprasito ho katz result. So if you're familiar with these kinds of things, um, this, this, is the, this is called the f-vector of a simplicial complex. It counts the phases, and then the H vector is one that's much more compressed. And uh, so they prove that the F vector is unimodal and log concave, and what we do is we prove that the H vector is unimodal and log concave. And that's a significantly stronger theorem. And to do that, we, ne we needed significantly stronger geometry. Um, and I think what I've learned from this, from this project is just it's really fascinating to talk to geometers, and you know, sometimes June would say, I think that there should be some kind of matrix object that has these properties. And, uh, he, has, he has crazy intuition, and he was right. And, um, uh, and we've developed a lot of actually very interesting pure matrix theory, at least interesting to me, that has come out of this. So we get, we get, this, we get, this, uh, we get to prove these uh, old conjectures. But we also get a lot of new interesting matrix theory that I think should be interesting to keep exploring. Okay? Um, so I think that's all I wanted to say. Thank you very much. What happens if instead of having finite, you ask countable? So if count, E is countable, for example. <laughs> oh, yeah. Countable like graph. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the question is, uh, right, what, what happens? What about infinite matroids? Um, and I think the answer is people have thought about them, and maybe some people in this room have thought about them, and, and I haven't. Uh, I think one thing that happens is that when you try to develop a theory of infinite matroids, then you find that some of these different models hold and others don't, and then you have to, you, you get different versions of, of infinite matrix theory. Like, do you, do you like to think about this model? Because if so, you get one definition. Or do you like to think about this model? If so, you get a different definition. So my, my impression, but I'm not an expert, but my impression is that the, there are a couple of theories of infinite matrix, and each one has uh, nice results. Um, I, I think one reason that, that I haven't thought about them very much is that I don't see where the geometry is. And, uh, and I tend, you know, it, it's, it's a bias. We all have biases, and I, I tend to like the things that come from the geometry. Uh, and I think that that's, that's where a lot of my nicer results have come from, and, that's, and so I wouldn't know where to look in the infinite case. So that's why I haven't. So on your last slide, can you say what that says in terms of uh, like G theorem? So you have the H's, so you get G vector being positive. Does this give anything new about uh, like simplicial spheres that aren't polytopal, or it's, it's talking about these complexes only? Um, so the, yeah, so the question is what, what this says about the G conjecture, and as far as I know, uh, nothing. Um, I mean, this is. So the, these, these kinds of questions are, are very actively studied in the context of, of studying uh, a, yeah, simplicial spheres. Uh, here we're, we're, we're studying a different kind of, kind of object. So at least uh, as far as I know, we don't, we don't have anything new to say about that. Yeah. So um, in that, I think it was like maybe a few back, you said you couldn't like give a nice step give a nice like uh, geometry. Um, but yeah, for this one, like, because it's like sort of like a flag thing, is there anything about the post set that you can point out? Uh, right, so, so if I'm understanding your question correctly, in, in the previous model, the, the Bergman fan is very close related to the, to the lattice of flats. They're almost the same thing. 
In this model, this fan, as far as I know, is not so intimately tied to a poset. Or if it is, we haven't uh, figured it out yet. My, my impression is that there's a lot of rich combinatorics and that this is, it, it is one of these things where it feels like we're only scratching at the surface of, of something that needs to be looked at more closely. But at the moment, uh, actually, once I wrote biflag this morning, I thought, okay, so is there a, a lattice of biflags or something? Um, and uh, maybe there is, but but we don't we don't have that at the moment. So does that definition wind up being equivalent or related in any way to a Lagrangian matroid? If you were thinking it comes from Lagrangian tropical spaces? Yeah, that's that, that's a good question. Um, so. I was mentioning how there's this theory of coxeter matroids. Um, so that's a, a matroid for any for any Lie type. And if I if if it is true that that this is a Lagrangian theory, I do feel like it should be Lagrangian matroids that are a part of it. Uh, I believe this is true. Uh, and uh, but I don't. We we haven't proved anything like that. But one thing that I will say is that if you take a matroid plus it's dual, that's a Lagrangian matroid. And, and that's what we're doing here. And so I, I, I feel like the, yeah, I feel like the, this, this might also make perfect sense for Lagrangian matroids and that's, that's one of the directions that, that comes up next in this, so yeah. Um, is there a characterization of the one-dimensional tropical varieties that come from the representable matroids? Or is it just they're all mixed in together? Um, let me think. I don't. I don't know of any of any results like that. So, can can you say something about whether you know, tropical linear spaces look different when the when the matrix you started with is representable or not? I don't. I don't know theorems like that. Yeah. It would be nice, but I, I don't. I don't know. And I guess you can also think about like you know finite fields or something. Uh, but uh, but yeah, I'm not, I don't know results like that. So for the h vector, you get that from a top polynomial by plugging in something like um, I guess there's different versions, but something like t inverse and one and shifting things around or maybe reversing them. So there's another polynomial uh, that you get by plugging in t inverse n1 plus t that has come up in a few places, um, which was conjectured by my supervisor, Dave Wagner, to be logarithmically concave. I'm kind of curious if the, uh, any of this stuff might shed light on that polynomial as well. Yeah, it's, it, it's, it's a good question. And I, maybe we can talk afterwards so, so that I can understand exactly what polynomial you mean. Uh, because there are there are a bunch of somewhat related polynomials for which this program might work. Um, this program has to start with figuring out what's the correct geometric model, and so I think in that case, maybe maybe another thing that I'll say about this is that uh, both both in the uh, uh, diprasito ho cats proof and in and in and in our proof with uh, Denham and Ho, these tropical objects uh, are at least inspired by by classical geometric objects. And so I think if, if, if one were to apply it for, for this polynomial, probably the place to start would be, is, is there an algebraic variety uh, that in the representable case has the correct intersection numbers? And then you can think about how you might make that combinatorial. Um, and yeah, I think you know, once this program starts succeeding more than once, then you have to start wondering, you know, what's, when does it work, when does it not work? What kinds of fans? Because it, it's, at least for me, it's extremely surprising that that these fans that look nothing like uh, like they should look like smooth projective varieties, that their cohomology behaves like that, and I, I don't think we have a good explanation of what's what makes some uh, some uh, tropical things have this property and some don't have it. I think that I think that needs an explanation. <laughs> 